So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to our prime scripture, Ephesians chapter 5. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Now this is over 2,000 years. And he says, well, let's read verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now I don't know why so many people love to have fellowship with the works of darkness. It's amazing to me how many church people have that trouble. And, and, and they think they're missing something. Verse 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou, thou sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So we're on a time frame. Your life is on a time clock. Everything has to do with time. Everything we do. The reason why I honestly believe some ministries suffer is because people didn't do what they were supposed to do on time. And God had to get someone else to do that. Well, why wouldn't God just do it? Because he knows people need things. And he operates in a system and he will not walk out of that system. Because he bound himself with Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break. Watch this. Nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. My daughter says, if you ever get my daddy to say something, me, she said, he will do it. So a lot of times I just keep my mouth shut because I know once I say something, I'm bound. But even if I said something I should not have said. Because the Bible says you swear to your own hurt. You understand that? Redeeming the time for the time are, e- are evil. In our first session, we preached on the pricelessness of time. I want to go over that because some of you were taking notes, so you make sure you wrote these things down. I told you great opportunity must be prepared for, not just simply waited for. So many people waiting on something when you ought to be preparing for something. Opportunity does not come loudly, but it often comes suddenly and stealthily, taking you unawares. This was on the first day we preached. The real difference between people is not in their chances, but in their ability to recognize their chances. Then we close out that first session with opportunities of time lead to solemn issues of eternity. What I'm doing here determines what I'll be and what I'm going to do when I get there. Now, you've got to understand that. Let me explain that for a minute. What you do here has got to last for eternity. Because it will be the foundation of what you're going to do when you get there. So this is a very important part of your living. Even though this life is but a vapor. But it's the foundation of what you're going to be and who you are and what you're going to do when you cross over into what we call eternity. That's the pricelessness of time. Then the second uh, session we dealt with the waste of time, saying that the waste of time is a criminal thing. It will always involve irreparable loss. Think about that. The waste of time is a criminal thing. You had time to do something. And usually if you don't, you lose it. It will always involve irreparable loss. I told you the need of doing is pressing because the time of doing is short. That's why God said, be ye therefore doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. I said also grass, lice, prizes, or you will end up in frustration and contempt. Or in other words, you got to win sometimes. In fact, you should win all the time. If you read the end of the book, you win all the time. But sometimes, some things we win, we don't like. Don't shout me down. There's some things God says, I would prefer for him to just keep to himself. But I'm not God. He's kind of like a parent. Your parent make you take things that you hated. How many of y'all ever took castor oil? Isn't that from hell? That's from hell, isn't it? But your mama or your grandmother always seemed to think it healed everything. Castor oil. How about this when you used to cut yourself, then they pour methylate in it. How many of y'all know what methylate is? That's from hell also. It burns. And they said uh, they had to put it in the cut.
Because if it didn't burn, it wasn't doing any good. Remember that? How many of your mamas put Vicksab up your nose? Rub your chest. People walking around you taking nose hits off your body. Remember that? How many of you had to swallow some of it? Do you know if you read the bottle, it tells you, don't swallow this. It will kill you. Am I telling the truth? And I finished out that session with only the power of the gospel can save the world from moral ruin. You can't legislate morality. Because without God inside the hope of glory, or God inside minded, you can't change. Hmm. Of course, last night I did something totally different. Now I want to go back to this. I'm going to deal with the urgency of time. And this whole series is time, my most precious commodity. I want you to write this down. When we fail to do our obligation to time, we contract debt and fall behind. When we fail to do our obligation to time, we contract debt and fall behind. I've had people ask me so many times, and I believe I've said it in some conventions, how did you get out of debt? It's very easy to get out of debt. And it takes a lot of time to get into debt. It's actually quicker to get out of debt than to get into debt. Because you don't realize what debt is doing to you until you oh, it's over your head. You can lose weight easier than you can gain it. It took you all your life to get as fat as you are today. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I don't care. That's not my business. But you can knock it off in three months or less if you get serious. It's not fun. I was talking about our house. We built this beautiful theater. It's not a home theater. It's a theater. And, you know, you just can't watch a movie without popcorn or ice cream. So I've gained about 15, 20 pounds. It has been the best time of my life. But we're back on it now. Back to carrots and celery. But it's healthy. Who cares about that? We should. So notice this. You can back up quicker than you can go forward. If you discipline yourself. Now, you got to get rid of all these excuses. Well, you know, mama fat, daddy fat. Uncle Fred's dogs are fat. It's in my jeans. Well, it looks like it's outside the jean on this side. <laughs> you know it and I know it. Hey, I'm talking to myself. Let me say it again. When we fail to do our obligation to time... We contract debt and fall behind. So how do I got out of debt? You see, I had to help myself to get out of debt. I had to discipline myself. Because all of a sudden, because see, the world is on the Babylonian system of debt. You could go to Sears or wherever you shop, Target, whatever, you know, whatever, I know, Walmart. You could buy, go to Sears, buy a washer and a dryer, a refrigerator and a freezer, a microwave oven, all this stuff. Bring it to your house and pay a note of $29 a month for 687 years. <laughs> now, your refrigerator ain't going to last that long. They don't want you to pay it off. You see what I'm saying? That's called contracted debt. All of you thinking, my, my God, I don't want to pay for this no more because it wore out. Well, no, no, that wasn't the issue. You got to pay for it. And they make the interest rate so high that you can't hardly pay it off. You see what I'm saying? Now, when you understand what I'm saying here, you'll understand this. But how do I do this? Well, write this down. What you think is connected to what you do. Not too many people thinking. 
What you think is connected to what you do. And what you do is connected to what you'll have and what you'll become in the process. Let me say it again. What you think is connected to what you do. And what you do is connected to what you'll have and what you'll become in the process. You have to think. Because see, the urgency of time will not wait for anyone. It will not. You see, when we're always trying to defeat time. That's why everybody's having plastic surgery. There ain't nothing wrong with that. I mean, hey, I, you know, some people get in bad. They don't want nobody to know they had some. They already know. How? They, lo- they looked at you before and after. And you look better after. I don't know why people freak out. If I had no teeth, I would get some false teeth. Why? Because I don't want my lips at the back of my throat. <laughs> You see people without teeth, my loss, they just change. So, I mean, if you want to do some work, do some work. And if you don't want to tell nobody, they're going to know anyway. The problem is it's very hard to do it all over. You got this beautiful face, but the arms are flopping in the breeze. The neck looked like a bloodhound that you could pick up. Now, how much money is going to take to fix that? Now, I don't care what you do to fix the outside. It doesn't change the time clock on the inside. They haven't got that good yet. So that's fine. I personally like my cracks and my wrinkles. I earn these babies. Now, what I don't like is this chicken neck. Look at that thing. I never had that before. But I saw something called Lifeline or Life Lift. I don't know what it's about. I might go check it out. So next time you see me, if I'm like this, I live in hurricane country. I'm going to just tell you I live in hurricane country. <laughs> no, I, don't, I heard it hurts. I don't like being hurt. You know, I don't like pain that much. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. The urgency of time is upon me. But that's okay. Write this down. We should not be bound by the horizon of time. The days are evil. That's true. But they are big with faith. The days are evil. And when I see evil things on the television, I go, oh, the day is big with faith. I have an opportunity to change this by redeeming it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Psalms 107 verse 2. For he hath redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. Let me say it again. We should not be bound by the horizon of time. The days are evil, but they are big with faith. So when I see these things, I go, oh, it challenges me to move farther, further, faster, and higher. Because I can accomplish what I set my mind to do. Why? How do I know that? That's not arrogance. Because I have the mind of Christ. I have the hope of glory. I have the nine fruits, the nine gifts, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I have so much to change evil days. The days are big with faith. You believe in God for your husband. What do I do? It's his tough luck. He married you. You have a promise older than he is of your family down to a thousand generations. Kathy proved that with me. I enjoyed going to hell. I enjoyed sinning. I never said, oh, it's been tough. Not me, buddy. I enjoyed drinking. Taking trips and never left my house. Called drugs. Woo, just come on back. I enjoyed seeing things in color. Now, you've got to break through that enjoyment. And she did through the Word of God. Her, her and my mother. You know, it was very hard to explain my mom. My mom was such a strong individual. I have a friend of mine who built my house, uh, Richie Pichon. It's actually pigeon, if you want to see it in English, but Pichon, French. 
And his grandfather used to tell him this. And I thought, that's a perfect thing of my mama. And, and the best way to say it is that they would say, you'll never be the man your mama was. <laughs> you'll never be the man your mama was. How many of y'all had a mama like that? Oh, your mama was something. Your mama controlled everything. Right? My mother controlled everything. Nobody knew what to do in the holidays, so they'd call her. Her name was Velma. They called her Velma. Vel, what are we doing? Where are we going? What are we eating? This is what we're going to do. Follow me. You just did. So all my cousins came together. All my uncles, my aunts, all of them, you know. I mean, because, but they always called my mother. She was the oldest girl, the oldest daughter. And you just did what she said. Mama fight you in a second. I've seen my mama hit a man, knock him out. Oh, my mama was tough. I'm not, I'm not exactly, my mama was tough. You raised in New Orleans. You do what you gotta do. I'll never be the man my mama was. And mama let daddy believe that he was the head of the house. Everyone knew it, including the dog, that he wasn't. But we just didn't want to hurt his feelings. The days may be evil, but they're big with fate. F-A-T-E. Not faith. Fate. See, I determine who I am. You know, someone questioned me on something with a priest last night. Not here. I preached that just not long ago at our home church. I, I didn't have a lot of time to get into it. If you really want to know more about that, I got that at my office. I'm not trying to sell it to you. Nothing like that. I don't have it here, none of that. It's so brand new. But mom would showed me things on how to operate and function. She said, if you're waiting on somebody to help you, you're always, you're burning daylight. I think she heard that from John Wayne. Because <laughs> I saw a couple of movies. He said, you're burning daylight. I said, he got that from my mama. <laughs> no, I think it's the exact opposite. I think, I think anyway, that I don't think my mother ever met John Wayne. But uh, uh, she used those things. And every time I came in, she said, what did you do today? Because you'll never have to do it again if you did it right. Which, which means is that you keep going further. She was not moved by the horizon of time. And she always asked me, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do? Well, Mama, I don't know. Now, that's a dumb thing to say. Now, you think about it. And then she come up with the religious stuff, which I drove me crazy. I talked to the Lord. This is what he said you're going to do, Mama. I ain't doing any of that. And she'd say, you stupid thing. <laughs> I bought my mother a home. Uh, but the only good thing I guess I did as a sinner, I bought her cars, and, that's, and I would just really razz her hard about God. I say, hey, God give you a car? Church people give you anything, man? No, the old sinner boy here. Me, ma, wah, me. I said, hey, God ain't give you that house. And she'd look at me and say, you stupid thing. God's using you and you don't even know it. <laughs> And that was true. <laughs> Think about that. The urgency. And she was always worried about me missing the rapture. One time she hid herself in a closet. <laughs> I must have been about 10 years. She said, one day you're going to come. Because see, mama was always home. Mama home. She said, one day you're going to come here and I'm not going to be here. And you're going to bust hell wide open. And we won't be here. And she saw me get off the bus. And she went and hid herself in a closet. <laughs> I walk in that first thing. I said, Mama, Mama, Mama. I look around, Mama. And me and my oldest brother, Wayne. Mama. Where's Mama? I said, we missed the rapture. <laughs> me and Wayne. Ah! What are we going to eat? I don't know. 
we missed the rapture. I didn't even know what the rapture was, but I knew I missed it. And she come flying out the closet, just a laughing. But when I saw her, boy, oh, God, she's here. My mama was a fat mama. I love a fat mama. Because when you're little, it get raining, just get up and eat the hip. And the water roll off. The water just roll off the hip. <laughs> and she always wanted to whoop us. I just grab her and sink myself in that fat, and she hit herself. I literally did those things. So I was able to do some things for her before she went home to be with the Lord. She had a hard time with receiving. I said, Mom, I'd like you at least spend a little time in this house. Enjoy yourself, Mama. Let me be a blessing to you. Please. And that was hard for her. Because that generation worked for everything they got. There was nobody, we were poor, but there was nobody had government cheese. Nobody had, I mean, you just dug it out the ground, whatever it took. You see what I'm saying? It was a different type of thinking. And you put your kids to work. My mother took care of her own, my own aunts when she was nine years old. She, had, she quit school at ten to take care of her, could take care of the house and cook. Can you see a ten-year-old girl doing that today? But that's just the way. And I'm not saying, I'm glad it's better today to need to get educated. Now, Mama was not educated in terms of college, but Mama could do anything. Mama could figure out anything. Now, you see what I'm saying? Because she knew that it was a time factor. And she had to make sure. She said, you're going to get educated. You're, go- you're going to do this. And my daddy, he didn't care what I did as long as I didn't bring him no trouble. He told my oldest brother, you want to smoke, boy? If you can buy them, you can smoke them. My brother had been smoking since he was six years old. My oldest brother. Am I telling the truth, Kathy? I mean, he, yeah, I'm trying, six years old. Mama said, you don't tell it to that boy. But if he's mama, ain't Isn't that sad? Six years old. Been smoking six years old. And she worried about me because I got myself into things I should not have got into. Because what, <laughs> I sure didn't see anybody in the church that I wanted to emulate. Because they're all poor as a, church, as, a church, as a church rat, like I said. They're all mad at each other. They're always talking about getting something and never getting it. You know what impressed me? The streets. New Orleans. Big cars. Flashy women. Diamonds. The mob. I was raised, but I was born in Algiers with the Sicilians. You do what you got to do. We take care of our own problems. Somebody mess with us. <laughs> Seriously, I could be. Mama said, I don't want you around them people. I said, but Mama, they got power. They got power, Mama. Yeah, but they're going to hell. Yeah, but they're going rich, Mama. <laughs> Satan to blind you with many, many terrible things. You see what I'm saying? Write this down. What she was trying was tell me this. Whenever greatness is achieved, it is through the force of well-kept rules. Whenever greatness is achieved, it is through the force of well-kept rules. Mama expected us to keep the rules. Let me help everybody in here. God expects you to keep the rules. That's what brings discipline, dedication, and commitment to your life. This urgency of time. When will we keep the rules? How many times do you have to hear a sermon on tithing before you start? How many times does somebody have to tell you to love your neighbor? How many, how, many, how many times? When will we start to keep the rules? Let me say it again. Wherever greatness is achieved, 
It is through the force of well-kept rules. See, that way you don't contract debt. Now, how do I got out of debt? Some of you heard me say this. I thought, there's no way I can get out of debt. But how do you buy a house cash? How do you buy a car cash? I mean, you know, it's the Babylonian system. You go to a bank or to a financial institution, you borrow money. You understand? I realized I did not have anything that I didn't have a note on. So me and Kathy went to Sears, and I bought a $119 coffee table. This is years and years ago. And people would come to my house. I said, I want to show you a debt-free coffee table. I got a mortgage on everything else. You, are you sitting on a couch that, bless God, they could pick up tomorrow if I don't pay the note. But that coffee table is staying there forever. Come put your hand on my debt-free coffee table. It sounded so stupid, but I had to have a point of contact. I had to keep a set of rules. I had to discipline myself. The greatest word I ever achieved in my life was self-denial. You got to tell yourself no sometimes. It helped me to achieve, to keep rules and regulations and things. And I found out all of a sudden my, all my furniture was paid for in our house, our little house we had. Now, and so people come, I say, touching, you can't find nothing inside this house that does not have, it don't have no debt on it. But I had to start with a point of contact, see? Because the urgency of time was on me. Because if I don't make that note, that interest rate still keeps kicking. It's every day. If you got a card in your pocket and you got some, uh, something on it, on your MasterCard or whatever, your Visa, or whatever, it's ticking right now. Do you understand? Right now you're being charged. You may not see it till the end of the month, but they're doing it on a daily basis. You see what I'm saying? Now, they keep very well-kept rules of charging you. When will we start using our power to keep these rules? And I'll never forget when I walked outside the house and looked at that car. I didn't know how, but I said, in the name of Jesus, one day I will pay you off very soon. I said, I'm going to set the time factor. And you know, brother, within a matter of months, I, my car was paid off. Now, I had all my furniture paid off and my car. And I never forget the great day when I turned and looked at that house. Now, that was the unbelievable. But I thought, if the rules will work for a $119 coffee table, then the rules are going to, and the rules work for that car I had out there, then the rules are going to work for this big, for this house. It wasn't a big house, 910 square foot. Remember that one, Kathy? I mean, <laughs> it was a small little house, but it was big to us. Oh, you know why I bought that? Because I thought to be a Christian, you had to be poor. And I thought, well, I've been poor before, so I'll just be poor. Gave my money away, done everything. I'm going to be poor. But every time I read the Bible, it came against everything I ever heard of. I thought, they told me don't read the Bible. Well, man, they did me a disservice. So we began to search the scripture. And I still keep these rules and regulations. Let me say it again. Wherever greatness is achieved, it is through the force of well-kept rules. I disciplined and got out of debt. Been out of debt so long, I don't even know what the word debt means. And I don't mean that trifling. You can do this, but you've got to start today. Because the urgency of time is on you. Remember, they're charging you right now. Now, you know what I like to think about? <laughs> I'm charging the bank right now. I have reversed the system. Look at me. I am making money right now. Oh, Jesus. Right now. <laughs> and I set the rate, not them. Ah, I'm doing that right now. It feels wonderful when money's working for you instead of you working for it. Now, when Kathy goes to shop and she, if she puts something on her card or whatever, it's, there's no interest ever paid. Just pay it off. You know, we do it for record keeping and things of that nature. You pay within, what's it, 30 days or 20 days? I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. I had a check given to me one time. We have a box in our ministry. 
And there was a check in there. I thought, I pulled it out. I freaked out. I said, what's this check? I don't have a check. Who, who give me a check? And Kathy said, don't put that in his box. He don't even know. He don't, he don't even know what he makes. I'll take the check. Just put it in my box. <laughs> and she did. And that's fine with me. I, I like it. That's the blessing of God. We just celebrated our 42nd anniversary. Me and Kathy. It was a good time. I told her, I said, you know, it's 42 years, a long time. That's a generation of Israel. 40 years, a generation of Israel. 42 years. And she said, what's the matter? Here? You? I said, no, 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 don't take that wrong. You know how women are. They, they're like cats, man. The fur going to come up real quick, you know. I said, no, 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 no. I, I said, it seems like it's been about 10 years. And that's really the truth. You know why? Time. It never waits for anybody. It just keeps going. You see what I'm saying? And I said, what do you want? I didn't ask her, what do you need? She don't have no needs. I said, what do you want? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I said, well, whatever. You know, I, I like to buy something, but I don't know. You know, I don't like to buy something that she don't like. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes our tastes are different. But most of the time, it's pretty, pretty on center. Well, I didn't find out what I bought for her till yesterday. <laughs> Gloria, I found out yesterday what I bought for her. I mean, and, 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 and let me just say, Brother Copeland and Sister Copeland, they treat us as speakers so kind. We have these phenomenal rooms. It's just nice. I mean, in fact, when he called me uh, uh, yesterday, I was talking to Brother Copeland on the phone. I said, I just want to say thank you for treating us so nice. And, and, and I, I said, George and Terry sent us the, this basket with all kinds of stuff. Ain't nothing healthy in it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, George. I appreciate that. I didn't see a carrot in there. Or oh, a piece of celery. It was so nice. They had an apple. Yeah. We didn't even touch the apples. But uh, it's so nice. You didn't have to do that, but they did it. You know, sometimes we need to say thank you a lot. So she comes walking out. Because in the foyer of this, this is a nice room. There's a foyer in there. There's this monster mirror. So I see her there going like this. She goes, ahem. Do you like it? Uh, what? <laughs> Do you like my... Oh, that. I said, when did, you, when did you buy that? Oh, a few days ago. I said, yeah, but you told me you was going to Oakland Heart, the jewelry store, to get an earring fixed. She said, but I got a revelation when I was there. <laughs> I saw something. I said, she said, do you like it? Yes. Thank you. She said, thank you. I said, you're welcome. How much did I pay for this? Oh, she said, you didn't pay for it. I just charged it. No. She just, and I'm glad because she said, yeah, uh, I wanted to get what she wants. My daughter says all the time, daddy, you are the hardest man in the world to buy. You have everything. No, I don't. I don't. I just don't. You get to a point in life. Uh, Whatever. I haven't worn suits much lately because there's nobody wearing suits. I think some people shocked last night that I had a suit and tie on. I do have suits, fine suits. But I mean, how many churches I went to last year, I only wore a suit one time the whole year. Because every time I went, they said, take your tie off. So now I bring extra clothes. So when they booked me, I said, what's the dress code? I don't know, because it's just, just the way it is. It's just the way it is out there. So I want to be what they want me to be, you know. And I had a young kid come up to me and said, I'm so glad you don't look like an old preacher with a suit and tie. I wanted to slap that boy. But I didn't. I said, okay. You know, but it's a different generation. That's fine. But if you are going to beat time, you got to have a set of well-kept rules. At our ministry, we have a set of rules and regulations that you follow. We have what we call a handbook. This is what we'll do for you. Now, what are you going to do for us? We set it and guide it down. And if you stay within these rules, you get blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out. If you don't, you're not going to work there very long. You see, there's some people who have worked for me. Or one, they, say, they think they're going to come and pray all day. I wish I could do that myself. That would be wonderful. But the ministry is a place of work. Why? 
reaching people, changing lives one soul at a time. You've got thousands of people calling you every week, thousands all over the world corresponding with you. Our partners and wonderful friends and this great things. Why? What, that need help. Which brings me to this point. We cannot get away from the responsibility of choice and the obligation of choosing the better part. Write it down. We cannot get away from the responsibility of choice and the obligation of choosing the better part. You see, you have an obligation of choice. That's one thing I love about God. He never forced me to get saved or stay saved. Now, I'm going to say something going to anger some homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theological people. Well, bless God, I don't care. Once saved, always saved. Not me. I understand who can separate me from the love of God. Hey, I mean, you know, I am a doctor of divinity. I can talk to you on a theological term. But you see, God made me free. I have a choice. If I can walk in, I can walk out. Now, I'd be stupid if I'd walk out. But he has not bound me. Ready for this? To his love. He's given it to me freely, fully, fearlessly, faithfully. But it's up to me to keep that. If I don't want to go to heaven, I can stop it today. With a sin called the unpardonable sin. Which means it's not pardonable. It's a life sentence of eternity of hell. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that a sinner cannot commit it. Only a Christian can. It's called the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Or the sending away the day of grace. It's there, ladies and gentlemen. It's there. And it's not because you made fun of somebody speaking in tongues. I found a guy one time in Columbus, Ohio. I left my briefcase by accident. And man, I'm, I'm, I'm in my hotel room. And, and Mike, I, I, I gotta go get my briefcase. I gotta preach it tomorrow. So I, I had my, my, my pilot. I said, uh, Drive me back to the church. I, I said, uh, 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 there's a man there. He's 24 hours security. I said, he'll let me in and go get my briefcase. As I walk in, I see this guy crying. He's just bawling, loose squalling. And I think, wow, somebody hurt him or something like that? And he saw me, I've committed the unpardonable sin. I've been praying all this time. I just can't seem to touch God. I said, you hadn't committed the unpardonable sin because if you did, you wouldn't be in this lot crying. Your conscience would be seared with hot iron. Boy, you wouldn't even think about God. I said, what happens is you don't understand righteousness. Now sit down on the concrete. Let me help you here. I said, you don't understand the righteousness of God. You're praying to God to touch you. And yet you, you, have not, you don't have a concept. You don't have a knowledge of it. And it didn't take long before you know it. He just shouting and praising God. Because he had made fun of somebody speaking in tongues. And he just thought that was the blaspheme of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. God's a lot bigger than that. See, he didn't understand his righteousness. But there is an unpardonable sin. I don't care what anybody says. It's there. Oh, well, I, I, I've been rawly criticized because I believe that Jesus died spiritually. In fact, I don't believe it. I know it. I can prove it. Oh, now, if you want to have some trouble with the theological world, oh, you get into that. Oh, you one of them JDS teachers? No. What I'm saying is, he took my sin. Are oh, you saying that Jesus was just an old rank sinner? No, you said that. I didn't say that. Jesus never was a sinner, but he was made sin. See, if Jesus was a sinner, he'd have had to repent. Have you ever heard Jesus repenting anywhere? Jesus never once asked his father for forgiveness. Why? Because he was not a sinner, but he was made sin. You were not righteous, but you were made righteous. A sinner has to repent. Has to ask God to forgive. Jesus never once asked his father to forgive them. Forgive him. He didn't do nothing. To all the Jewish people that are watching, I know one that fulfilled and kept the law. He kept the law. He fulfilled it, but he didn't throw it away. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Listen to me. You see what I'm saying? He was made sin. He was not made a sinner. See, people think we're saying he was an old sinner and all of you were just a sinner. No, no, no. you saying that. I'm not saying that. He was made sin. I wasn't made righteous. I mean, I, I wasn't righteous. I was made righteous because of his sacrifice. But when he took my sin, it did not make him a sinner. He was made sin, but not a sinner. A sinner is an act and an obligation of a choice to sin. He did not sin. That's why he couldn't stay in the bowels of hell with the bulls of Bashan. Go read it. Every theological 
Bible school or university teaches on the bowl of Bashan, will thou leave my soul in here? You can't lock somebody up without no evidence. Amen. You can't hold them without no evidence. You may arrest them, but you can't hold them. And God the Father said no, and he redeemed us. Did I just help some people here? You never sin by yourself. That's another thing. I, should I say that? Yeah. There's a scripture in the Bible that just blows people's brains out. If you willfully sin, there remain no remission of sin for you. Excuse me. Excuse me. Come on. Let's let the elevator go to the top here. All right? Let me straighten something out. If you willfully sin, there remain no remission of sin. I said, well, I'm in trouble. Because I have willfully sinned. The Lord said, no, you haven't. I think I have. I think I got some evidence for the fact that I have. He said, no, you haven't. You've never sinned by yourself. Let me help you here. Oh, y'all got quiet, huh? You had not sinned by yourself. There's someone drawing you to sin. The Bible said when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin hath conceived or finished, it bringeth forth death. He said, you've never sinned by yourself. You had a tempter. Now, why didn't God make a plan of redemption for Satan? He made one for you. He loved Satan when he was Lucifer, right? Why didn't he make a plan of redemption? Because he willfully sinned. Well, how did he willfully sin? Because you see, Satan didn't have a tempter. Oh, Baba Shakaburu, listen to me. He said, I will exalt myself above the Most High God. I will sit in the congregation of the North. I'm going to start a revolution. He didn't have a tempt to pull in. You have. Yeah, it's according to your will, but your will was completely reversed by the temptation. Satan never was tempted. Make it simple. Got a baby, grandbaby at your house, trying to walk around the little coffee table, grab something, knock it over. That's no problem. That's what a baby does. You see something? Now, let the baby, grandchild, become 18 years old. Walk into your house, kick the thing off the coffee table. You say, come here. <laughs> now, that's a willful sin. Did I help you today? Yeah. Listen to me for a minute. <laughs> you got to understand what's around you. That principalities work through personalities. That's not demon possession. Somebody fly off the handle. Oh, the demon was it. No, that's a principality working through a personality. Sister so-and-so is a devil. No, she ain't a devil. She was a devil. She kidnapped you. He's a serial killer. You get around a serial killer, you are going to die. That's his nature. Now, that's possession. I, I promise you this. You watch any program about serial killers and look into their eyes. Every one of them have the same exact Look, because it's the exact same demon. You cannot get away from the responsibility of choice and the obligation of choosing the better part. So I chose to be made righteous. So I have no sin against me. <laughs> he doesn't remember anything against me at all. But I had to make that choice. But if I want to reverse it, oh, now I'm getting the theology here. Oh, I can I'd be stupid if I did. But that's exactly what Satan did. Oh, Lucifer, who became Satan. What caused that to happen? Power. He wanted power. You must be superior to power instead of driven by it. Watch the little... How do I say this? The beginnings of problems with power is the word called preeminence. That you just got to have the attention. You're down on a very dangerous path. Preeminence will make you become, and it's the right word, intoxicated. Toxicated. And grabs you. But if you redeem the time because of your obligation of choice and choose the better part, you'll not do those things. When I was young... 
when I was a small boy, raised very poor, I wanted money. We didn't have any. Because I saw all these people with money. Then I got to thinking, what am I willing to do for money? Kill somebody? As long as I don't know them, why should I worry about it? It's called business. It ain't personal. Just business. You see how you begin to twist this? It's called intoxicant. It's a toxic. So I wanted to make money. I began to make money. I started playing music, and I had, a, and God gave me the talent, and I perverted it, and I used it. And I remember being so disappointed in Dallas, Texas. I'm 22 years old. I am making money. I'm a rocker. That's what I did. I worked on the same circle as Led Zeppelin, Grand Funk, Alice Cooper. I'm talking girls just a screaming boy. But I just had long, I, you know, I got hair. I mean, I had, it was brown, thick, and, you know, just, I, and, you know, just crazy. And I thought, if I could just get enough money, I'm going to be happy. And I remember telling Kathy, I'm so disappointed. What are you disappointed? I don't know. I, I, I can go do what I want to do, and I'm not fulfilled. You can't run away from what you carry with you. Am I helping you? You can't run away from what you carry with you. You carry it. <laughs> I was happy. I was so disappointed. That's why I was drinking so much. I was trying to find the high. And there is a high called the most high. But it was formed in the institution of religion. Which hid who he was. Through Daily obligation. Couldn't talk to God. God was the greatest mafia don I ever met in my life. He make you an offer you don't refuse. He put a hit on you and he ain't going to get arrested. How many times you heard it from the church where God killed him people? Oh, God's got a bunch of hit men on his, on his, on his uh, payroll? Don't shout me down. Listen to me. That's what's being said in churches all over the world. So why would I want to serve him? He's not a part of my family. Hmm. Everybody was lying in church. The only one who was telling the truth was the devil. The devil said, I'll kill you. They were saying God was killing and blaming. The devil was killing and blaming God for the killing. We heard one time on TVN, God will abuse you, then he'll use you. <laughs> I am not kidding you. Now, I didn't say that. A person said, and they went, oh, that's good. No, that ain't no good. Abusers go to jail. God will abuse you, then he'll use you. Why do you have to have your butt kicked so hard before you learn something? <laughs> Excuse my French here, but listen to me. Why do you have to go through something? Why can't you just listen to Kenneth and Gloria Copeland? They preach it. Say, okay. It's like my brother-in-law went to a doctor. It's so funny. Talk about a smart man. He wrote law review with Sam Irvin on the Watergate committee. I mean, my brother-in-law is brilliant, brilliant. He goes to the doctor and says, "Doc, what's this? <laughs> this is so funny to me." He says, well, "He said, what's wrong? I, said, I got a problem with my arm. Every time I do this, it hurts." He said, "Well, don't do that." <laughs> that makes just total sense. And he walked out and said, I spent all that money for him to tell me not to do that. Well, you couldn't figure it out for yourself. You can't run away from what you carry with you. The urgency of time. you got to remember that Satan is using time to do everything. Here we go. You know, as you get older, things begin to shut down. You know, your mama had diabetes, your daddy had heart trouble, your grandma died of cancer. You know, it follows the family. They've put a time frame on it. Young people don't talk about cancer. They talk about partying. Until you have a child that has cancer. When are we going to shut this devil down? How many children will he kill? Thank God for St. Jude's Hospital. At least they're fighting him with everything they can in the natural. Thank God for that. So if we could put spiritual with it, wouldn't that be wonderful? 
You see, it's the urgency of time. Let me say it again. We cannot get away from the responsibility of choice and the obligation of choosing the better. I heard people say, well, I'll just tell it like it is. Oh, you do. Listen to this. People that tell it like it is end up living exactly as they tell it. <laughs> Their faith is working. It's just taking them in the wrong direction. When I got born again, I'm going to close with it. I did stupid things. I didn't know that money was evil. But then I couldn't figure out. I would go to work, Mike, and I'd think, well, how come I'm working for something evil? Why do I get mad if they don't give me some evil more money? I don't understand that. But I get, well, I remember the day that the light turned on. I think I'm going to read this Bible for myself. And I heard this, well, you're not going to understand it. Well, that's calling me stupid. Maybe I can understand it. I did listen to the teachers. I learned how to read. I learned how to assimilate things. Now, Kathy don't like me to fix things because I can't fix nothing. She said, you, you fixed the toilet the other day and they flushed and the light went on. You know, so, you know, I try. I'm not good at that. So we have people that do those things. She said, I have a problem with my toilet handle. This is a gold toilet handle. I said, okay, I'll fix that thing. <laughs> she said, it ain't working, Jesse. I said, well, let's just, see, my fixing, well, let's just go buy a new one. No, no, all it takes is a plumber. But yes, but I got an Allen wrench. You don't even know who Allen is, Jesse. <laughs> Keep your hand off my toilet. <laughs> well, you know, I want to try to fix something. <laughs> Now, where they really think I'm worth something, oh, Jesse, the minister need an extra million dollars. What are you going to do? Oh. That's my responsibility. I'm the CEO, chief executive officer. Boy, I wish I could be a boss. It ain't fun being a boss. Because you see, when you go home, the business goes with you. You're on vacation, and the business is with you. You're trying to lay down at the beach, and the business is with you. Now, your employees are laying on the beach saying, oh, God, this is so great. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. It's the position you hold. Hmm. The Bible said, be you doers of the word. Doers make the world go around. We write books about doers. You ever notice that? We write books about them. Doers. We don't write books about heroes. And when someone tells me I can't do something, they just told me I can. Why? Because you see, if they think they can't do it, then certainly they know I can't. Well, wait a minute. Maybe God didn't tell you to do that. Doug Neese is Gloria Copeland's brother. Precious man. I really love Doug. Used to um, uh, buy all my television time. And now we've developed some kind of something. I don't, they've done something. I don't know. Anyway, make a long story short. We were talking about Doug yesterday, me and Courtney, John Copeland's daughter. So I think she worked with Doug a little bit. She said, yo, she said, my Uncle Doug got a bunch of pictures of you in his office. I said, well, that's nice. Benny Hinn said, Jesse, you're the only preacher that I have a picture of in my home. I said, well, that's nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Watch this. Huh? Doug came down. This is years ago. We're going to break out on secular television. Uh, we've been on TV and in a couple of the satellites. Now we're going to come. Because see, now you get to secular television. Uh, one, sometimes one station costs more than the whole satellite of a, of a Christian network, depending on where the network goes at. Things. So we asked Doug for some information because he, un he knows how to do that. So we come down, and we sit in our boardroom, and Doug says, well, how many stations do you like to start out with? This is many years ago. I said, well, let's start out with ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Okay, how many stations would you like? I said, let's start with 20. Now, you've got to understand, some stations are $50,000 a week times 52. <laughs> they don't give this away. Television's not very, very expensive. I said, well, let's start 20 stations. 
Okay. So we picked out several stations, you know, Doug really helping us. I mean, he was just really great, helping me and Kathy. And blessing of the Lord. Anyway, I, he said, now, I know you've been listening to them Copeland tapes. <laughs> I said, yeah, quite often. He said, now, Jesse, it's going to take anywhere from 18 to 24 months for you see some of the return on all this. You know, because you have to, you know, yeah, people got to know you're there to start with. And so he's given me what I call the natural way of understanding. He says, so you want to believe God. How long will y'all want to believe God that this will, people will listen and they'll become a partner and they'll help you pay for this. And so how, we, how long you want to believe God for, uh, for this to, where well, it can take care of itself. Now, me and Kathy said it in unison. Two weeks. Doug, look at us. You know, Doug, <laughs> them Copeland tapes are working, aren't they? I said, yeah, they're working. <laughs> I said, that's the law of the prospect. Two weeks, Doug. I said, I got 14 days when we start. I expect after 14 days, all of them are paid for. Now, Doug, person, man, he's a good businessman, too. You know, he ain't, he ain't nobody's fool. He went, okay. <laughs> My magazine has never been late. So we're going to do this big push in the magazine. We're going on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Boom, 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 boom. All of this time, all of a sudden, printers call us and say the magazine's late. Never has been late in all our years. Because we're trying to get it out so people know where we are so they can tune in to see us. It was late almost a week. So we started. But we didn't change what we said. Two weeks. So we lost about six days, not quite seven. Finally, the magazine came out and hit people's homes. And the reason why we knew that, because many people called and said, Hey, I got your magazine, so you're going to be on tomorrow. Now, you got to remember, it was on the week before, they didn't even know we were there. So actually, if you had 14, they take six from, six from 14 is what? Eight. So we actually had eight days for our prophetic utterance to come to pass. <laughs> but isn't prophecy history wrote in advance? Yes, yes. What are you prophesying today? Urgency of time. Because it's history wrote in advance. So me and Kathy said, well, praise God, we're going to have this thing paid by next Sunday. Do you know, eight days later, when we walked in, that was eight days, the eighth day turned out to Stephen to be on Sunday. So we came to work on Monday. Monday, when we went to the office, received our mail, we had paid for all 20 stations. Wait, 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 don't crawl. For a year. Now you can talk. So, to Gloria and Kenneth, those tapes worked. But we believed them. I got your address. <laughs> it worked. Doug calls us and he goes, well, how we doing? I said, Doug, it's paid for you. My God. Wow, man. I said, did you believe it? He went, Yeah. <laughs> He said, I'm writing a check right now. Bless God to you. And now the guy that I'm supposed to pay, which he deserves to be paid because that's his work, writes me a check to the ministry. That's pretty good, isn't it? Now, Doug told me this later on. People heard about that because I said it. They called Doug and said, no, I want to be on them same stations that Jesse's on. Because that's, that, 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 that's a money-making station there, buddy. I ain't going to have to fight it. And Doug said, let me tell you something. You better make sure God told you to do this. And everyone that bought that time busted. Because they thought, if they see him, they'll see me. They didn't realize that God was involved in this. It wasn't that people like me better than they like them. That ain't got a thing to do with it. But I heard the voice of the Lord. And the urgency of time was upon me. You see what I'm saying? Until to this day, to this day, we have not struggled on anything whatsoever at all. Adjusted the plans ministry because of our faithful partners. But we do what we say. Amen. I had a guy call me the other day. Called my office and says, I want to give you a big bunch of money, but I don't want to go on the aviation. I said, what other ministers you called and said that to? He mentioned several of them. Can you tell me without a shadow of a doubt he won't go to aviation? I said, yeah, designate it. I said, aviation don't need your money. Well, I heard you believing for another plane. I said, well, it certainly ain't coming from you. <laughs> and I wouldn't believe for another plane. I have a plane. I don't never have to buy another plane. 
I got a Falcon 50, which is the competitor of the Citation, and we can fly anywhere in the world, just like it. But you know what the Lord told me? I'm sitting there going good. He says, you're going to let your faith stagnate? Uh, time, Jesse. Time. Come on, Jesse. But I don't need it. Did I say anything about need? Well, well, no. He says, so you're going to let your faith stagnate. But Lord, I didn't think I was letting my faith stagnate. Time, Jesse. Time. Did I say go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature? I said, but Lord, the only thing I can do is get something bigger. He said, what's wrong with that? Nothing. I just never thought of it. He said, you might want to bring some people with you. I mean, you'd like to go. And I never thought of that, Dan. I, I, I said, but I, I'm trying to argue with God. He said, time. Come on. You, you going to let it stagnate? I said, I'm sorry, Jesus. Forgive me. You see, you got to be careful on this thing. That when everything's met, you don't just sit on your laurels. There's a world dying and going to hell. And it must be preached the gospel. I said, forgive me, Lord. Since we're talking, I said, I know what to do. So I went to the FAA and bought me another number. They said, what number you want? I said, I want F or N7 Juliet Delta. They, they call it JD. Uh, everything is a, a thing. Like if it's uh, Victor Charlie, or if it's VC, they don't say whatever you say. They use these terminologies. And I bought it. I said, now what would fit with 7 Juliet Delta? Falcon 7 Juliet Delta, which is the equivalent to the new... Uh, Gulf Stream 550 or 650. I mean, it's up. It's just up there. How much money is it? I don't care. I'm not paying for it. He didn't ask me to pay for it. He asked me to believe for it. See, that's the problem with some of you preaching. You're trying to figure out how to pay this thing when he's asking you to believe for it. Urgency of time. He ain't just asking you to believe for it. So you mention it. I'm believing this. So... We're believing God that we're going to fly one day to this Southwest Believers Convention in a Falcon 7. Ooh, Lord Jesus. Now they're mad at me now, brother. The secular media is mad at me. I tell you what I tell you what But it don't make no difference. I'm going to fly over their head. Amen. Amen. You see, if they have the power, and I close with this, to, to stop time by making you think I'm doing something bad with my partnership, I have the power to increase time by making something good to my partners. And do what you said. So I told, I had my staff told this man, listen, you want to give something this much you can, designate it. We'll put it to that. Doesn't make any difference. They gave us, uh, during the Hurricane Katrina thing, $3 million was given to our ministry. $3 million. 100%. A lot of money was raised for Hurricane Katrina. I mean, I had several ministers. If I tell you right now, they went out and bought things. And, paid, and people didn't get it. Every nickel and dime was given to people during Hurricane Katrina. And some of the greatest ministers of the gospel said, you send that to Jesse Francis, it's going to go there. And we did. Why? Because my word is my bond. I'm not bragging on myself. What I'm saying was the urgency of time. There are people sitting on, 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 on bridges that hadn't had water. We've got to do something here. And we did. And it was a great time. I'm not bragging on it. And Kathy went to, we both went to work. I mean, hard work. I was the first corporate aircraft that allowed to be landing in New Orleans, Louisiana. The FAA let me land, the very first one, between two Black Hawk choppers. Felt like Vietnam. And man, they're on the side of my plane. You know why they let me? Because I was coming to help. And yet I went to a minister's meeting and I had guys come. They said, boy, I tell you what, people send us money. And we, we bought this building. We're doing it. I said, they didn't send that money to you for that. Did you have? And I had other ministries. Employees were calling me. Did you, uh, 
call up and did Brother Jesse pay you? Oh, yeah, the day of Katrina he paid us. Why? Because, you see, partners, we do what we say. You know, it's a new thing in the world. It's called doing what you say. So God trusts us. He trusts us. He trusts Kenneth. You bless this Kenneth Oak ministry, they're going to do what they say. And if you ever get a chance to preach with that man, and there's a tornado coming down the road, he ain't, he ain't going nowhere. That's right. And if it's raining, cats and dogs, and we don't, we're not under a building, you're going to get wet. And if all the lights go out, he's going to put a flashlight in your hand so you can read your Bible and preach to people. He don't quit. Gloria was preaching in Florida with a tornado ripped the roof off. You think it stops the Gloria? Now everyone turn to Ephesians. <laughs> Got to the, get the woman out the building, man. I mean, tell you, people are flying down the hallway. Oh, there's Gloria. What's the word <laughs> Now, that's integrity. Why? Because there was a time frame on that meeting, Gloria, and you was going to accomplish what God called you to do. But there's a tonic. I know. Next. That's the obligation of choice. That's choosing the better part. Did you enjoy it this morning? Now. 